Okay, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to Board Manging, where we are playing some Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. We're moving on to case number three, Trace, Twa, all that good stuff. I know I promised and said that I was going to have another person help me out to help my, my brain, but I just couldn't really seal the deal, I guess. Not many people are interested in testing their wits and comparing themselves to Sherlock Holmes only to really learn how stupid you are, I guess. So, yeah, it's just me and my brain again and you listening to my failures. So I'm sure it'll be perfectly fine. We're, case number three is the Mystified Murderess. And it takes place on the 4th of July, 1888, which, as we all know, is a very big holiday in London. So... Uh, I'm sure there'll be some parties going on. We're going to have to deal with some stuff. Fireworks. It'll be crazy. So let's begin with reading the uh, the preamble. <sighs> At 221B Baker Street, we find Holmes just as Dr. Watson's note had described him. Listless, unresponsive, oblivious to all around him. He's not resorted to the needle as yet, whispers Watson. My plan may keep him from it indicating the newspaper clipping in his hands. A tightrope walker at the Regal Italian or the Royal Italian Circus fell to his death. Foul play suspected. What do you think, Holmes? No answer. Society burglar strikes again. Hmm. A series of burglaries. Six such over the period June second to June seventeenth. On july second, the seventh occurred at the home of Sir Sanford Leeds. Cleopatra Tiara stolen. As in the others, no sign of extensive search by the thief and only one piece of jewelry involved. Victims elsewhere at the time. Here's a complete list of the particulars, Holmes, if you'd care to read it. Silence. Ah, here's a puzzle. A hansom picked up a fare at its regular stand. Passenger spoke up when he realized that they were headed in the wrong direction but got no answer. Oh my. Cabby was dead, still sitting upright in his seat, a knife in his back. It actually says Bach here, by the way. It, act, it like it actually says Bach, I swear to you. So I don't know if Bach is like an old term for back, or if somebody really messed up on their keyboard, man. I don't know. A policeman managed to halt the vehicle. Around the cabbie's neck was a pouch containing thirty Roman coins, denarii. The stupid fools! Exclaims Holmes. If they had allowed the horse to proceed, it would have led them to the scene of the crime. Let me see that, Watson. Watson hands him the clipping and casts a self-satisfied smile in our direction. As Holmes, his enthusiasm restored, occupies himself with the clippings, the doorbell rings. I beg you for your help, Mr. Holmes, and treats a tall, bespectacled young man, identifying himself as Gerald Locke. Three days ago, Guy Clarendon was found murdered at Halliday's. It's preposterous, but Miss Frances Nolan has been charged and is being detained at the criminal court, Old Bailey. I was just about to bring the matter to your attention, Holmes, says Watson, waving another clipping. I can't believe that she is capable of murder, even of such a scoundrel as Guy Clarendon. Scoundrel, asks Watson. I've only heard very good things about the younger Clarendon. Scion of a wealthy family, an accomplished batsman for the West London Cricketeers, a ranked fencer in international competition. He was a bounder, very fond of cards and strong drink, and he associated with some rather low East End height types. His father had all but disinherited him. I tried to tell Francis that he was only after her money, but to no avail. Francis and Loretta Nolan, says Holmes. Suddenly stirring to life, the surviving heirs of Sir Malcolm Nolan, founder of the Aberdeen Navigation Company. Sir Malcolm and Lady Nolan were killed when an avowed anarchist, one Zagreb Yablinsky, threw a bomb into their carriage, mistakenly thinking it carried the Duke of York. Loretta Nolan, aged four or five at the time, was also in the carriage. Miraculously, she was uninjured. Yes, the gory details of the assassination, as well as those of the disposition of a considerable estate, were well documented in the tabloids. Mr. Locke, you are the suitor for Miss Nolan's hand, are you not? Yes, he admits. Why was Miss Nolan charged with the murder? Ah, well, Locke hesitates. He seems very uncomfortable and removes his spectacles, wiping them as a cover for his distress. Finally, in a low, resigned voice, he answers, She was discovered over the body with a pistol in her hand. Holmes nods, takes up the clipping of the cabbie's death again, and turns a deaf ear to Locke's renewed protestations of Miss Nolan's innocence. 
I'm sorry, Mr. Locke, he says, finally cutting it off, but I cannot personally take your case. Another very pressing matter has come to my attention. He goes to retrieve his hat, adding, You can rest assured, however, that I could not leave you in better hands, and then he is gone. Ah, well, Mr. Locke, sputters Dr. Watson, you must excuse, uh, that is, as Holmes suggested, we will spare no pains to get at the truth. You have nothing to worry about. Uh, I, I'm sure I don't, says Locke, sounding rather unconvinced. Okay. It was a whole jumble of nonsense. I have to get a piece of paper. Actually, I forgot that. Tragic misstep. I'm not going to write on the newspaper, so I will return. Okay, so the question in my mind is, are the other stories and clippings mentioned of any importance? Because I realize from the last case, and this is going to be my assumption going in, is that every single name of anything mentioned is important, at some level, at least worth thinking about. Last time I completely dismissed a very important... A vital clue, a name, just because I didn't think it was important. And I can't make that same mistake. So, I guess I have to write down all this stuff, and we'll think about it. So, because right now it doesn't seem very important, but you know how this game can get. It's tricky. So, uh, Tight Roper, Royal Italian Circus... Uh, fell to his death. Probably not related, but I said that last time. Um, society burglar. Okay, society burglar. Six burglaries. Sanford Leeds. I'll write that name down because it's a name. Names are good and important. Sometimes. Um, okay. So then there's the case that apparently Sherlock himself is off to solve, which is the the dead cabbie and 30 denarii around his neck. I highly doubt that's involved. But I'll write it down. Okay, and then we get to our main case. Our uh, client is Gerald Locke, which is a cool name. Well, Locke's a cool name, I guess. And he is a suitor or something like that, I think. Yeah, he's the suitor of the suspect. Whose name is Francis Nolan. Right? Or no, yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Yes, I, I had that correct. Okay. Suitor of suspect, Miss Francis Nolan, who is suspected of killing a Mr. Guy Clay... Oh, no, Guy Clarendon. Oh, God. Somebody was going to kill him eventually, I'm sure, with a name like that. Okay, so it was three goes ago, three days ago. So that would be July first. July first. Okay, murdered at Halliday's. Definitely on our list to check out. Um, being held at Old Bailey. 
I've heard of this. I've heard of this place. It exists. Okay, so let's talk about Clarendon then. He was the younger Clarendon, so apparently he has a brother. I'm going to write down younger brother. Uh, wealthy family. West London Cricketeers. And a fencer. But he was also very fond of cards and drink. Good to know. And associated with some... Oh, okay. His father had all but disinherited him. Uh, asshole. There we go. Possibly after Nolan Money. I am, of course, only going to think of Christopher Nolan during this whole case, but okay. Okay, so let's talk more about Miss Francis then. Uh, sister is Loretta. Surviving heirs of Malcolm. And we don't have a name for the lady. So whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, Malcolm Nolan was the founder of the Aberdeen Navigation Company. Okay, and they were killed by a man known as Zagreb Yablinski. I mean, yeah, I could just go back and reference all this information, but having it on paper where I can kind of draw lines and do things like that, I think is pretty good. Mistake for Duke of York. Or were they? Probably. Uh, unharmed. Her sister was unharmed by explosion. Okay. DM intervention, perhaps. Okay, and then there's the big, the big piece of evidence that she was convicted or suspected upon, whatever, is that um, she was discovered over the body with a pistol in hand. That's pretty big. It's pretty big. Okay, so that's, that's kind of all things written down that we want to go off of. Always go to the crime scene first, right? That's really just a no-brainer. It's what we got to do. So that would be Halliday's. I, I imagine pretty much every case you're going to go to the crime scene first. It just seems like what Holmes would do. So the Halliday Hotel 15 SW, let's do it. We leave the manager's office at Halliday's private hotel knowing little more than we did when we entered. He is too upset over the police quarantine of Clarendon's room to be of much help. Fortunately, the day clerk is a much less excitable fellow. The gentleman registered under the name of Clarence Guy on the 29th of May. He was given a front room on the third floor. Two days later, he asked to be moved to Suite 205. During his stay here, he had only two visitors that I am aware of. One was a most disagreeable chap. He was very large, had a thick walrus mustache and a prominent scar down his cheek. He arrived on the 1st of June, the very day of Mr. Guy's, that is, Mr. Clarendon's move. He simply came in, sat down in the lobby, and waited. I kept an eye on him, but I must admit I was reluctant to ask him his business. Twenty minutes or so later, Mr. Clarendon came down from his room. As he passed the big man... Oh, as he passed, the big man yanked him aside. I'm sure I detected fear on Mr. Clarendon's face and was about to send one of the boys for a bobby when Mr. Clarendon signed me 
that all was well. After a few minutes of conversation, they left together. I never saw the man again. His other visitor, who came by quite frequently, was a very striking woman. She was quite fashionably dressed, and she had a most distinctive laugh, very full and deep. I have no idea who she was. Tell us about the morning of July 2nd. It was about 9 o'clock when a woman entered. She was rather plain looking, and I would not have noticed her but for the fact that she came in the front door, looking neither left nor right, and proceeded directly to the staircase. Normally, non-residents are not allowed to pass without first stopping at the desk. I was on my way to intercept the woman when I was buttonholed by Mr. Rams... Buttonholed? I don't want to know what that means. By Mr. Ramsey. He's a guest of long residence and a chronic complainer, and he would not let me go. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when you're getting buttonholed, that's kind of the end of it. It couldn't have been 30 seconds later when there was a woman's scream. I dashed up the stairs to the second floor where the hallway was full of inquisitive guests. They directed my attention to room 205 and said they heard a faint bang before the scream. There I found the body of Mr. Clarendon and the aforementioned woman. She was lying in a swoon in the center of the room with a pistol in her hand. I revived her with some whiskey found in the room. When she came to, she was totally disoriented. She had no idea where she was or what she had done. When she saw Clarendon's body, she gave out a small cry and let go of her pistol as if it were red hot. I took her to a nearby vacant room and had the police summoned. At our request, the clerk calls a sleepy bellboy to show us the suite. On our way to the room, we discover that the lad has been shifted to day duty after working nights. Inquiring further, we learn that the front doors are locked at 10 p.m. so that any guests or visitors must be let in by the night staff. Clarendon, leading a most exemplary life, was always in his room before 10. The constable on guard lets us into the two-room suite and oversees our tour. The sitting room walls are papered in a subdued floral pattern. The ceiling is covered with yellow plaster. The constable indicates the entryway to the bedroom as the place where the body was found. There is some blood on the carpet. A larger stain had apparently been made by the spilled contents of two wine glasses lying nearby, one shattered. In the center of the sitting room, some 15 feet away, are small flecks of yellow plaster. I search, a search of the sitting room yields nothing much in the way of personal items. In the top desk drawer, however, we find a folded bank statement from Cox's. And it shows a picture of the bank statement. It says, uh, 06, 1888, so that would be June. Mr. Guy Clarendon withdraws. He withdrew 5,000 pounds or sterling? I don't know, 5,000 of some currency on June 1st. Then he deposited 2000 on June 16th and then deposited another 500 on the 18th. Okay. We wander into the bedroom. In the closet there are but two shirts and three pairs of shoes. One of them a pair of canvas fencing shoes dyed black. In the dresser there is the usual assortment of underwear and shirts. Loosely tossed in the top drawer is a black wool sweater and a pair of black trousers. Not much of a room, comments Wiggins, looking out of the open bedroom window. The brick wall of the building across the alley is dreary indeed. Even the ivy vines which wind up the trellis and cover the back wall of holidays are dusty and cheerless. Whoa! Yeah, you can tell that's a crime scene section because it's long as hell. Okay. I have some things rocking around in my head, but let's let's think. Of, let's go through this and, and we'll see what's going on. Okay, so he registered under a false name, which usually you do when you're doing bad shit. I mean, let's be honest. So, um, that's not a good sign. Registered under Clarence Guy, May 29th. He's given a front room on the third floor, but two days later, he moved. So, two days later, moved to suite 205. Okay, so that could be kind of a clue if we think, what's a front room? I assume a front room is like the front of the hotel, so you're looking out onto like the city you know the streets right you have a good view i would assume with a front view and he switched then to a suite and in this room wiggins commented not much of a view looking out of the open bedroom window the brick wall of the building across the alley is dreary indeed even the ivy vines which wind up the trellis and cover the back wall of holidays are dusty and cheerless so he switched to 
He had a really nice room. Front room, I guess. That's got to be pretty damn nice. And then he switched to a suite that had a really shitty view. So I don't think he's there for the view. I don't think he's there for recreation. He's got something in mind. Okay. Um, okay, so two visitors. Let's see here. First visitor... Sounds like a bad guy. Sounds like a goon in a in an action movie, personally. Um, large, thick mustache. And as everybody knows, if you have a thick mustache, you're a bad person. Mustache. Um, prominent scar down his cheek. Interesting. I don't know if there's any relevance to that. Okay, so he arrived on the day that a guy switched rooms. Yes, there is significance to that. He came in, sat down in the lobby, and waited. And he was obviously waiting for Mr. Clarendon. The question is, did Mr. I don't think Mr. Clarendon knew he was going to show up. But perhaps a gang of some sort? I, I don't know. I, hmm. I don't know. We'll ponder that. The other, other visitor, quite frequently, very striking woman. Very distinctive laugh. Okay. Striking woman. Distinctive laugh. Uh, fashionably dressed. That's a good clue. Quite frequently. First thought would be uh, Loretta, perhaps, the other sister, possibly. Okay, the woman that entered, of course, was Frances, rather plain looking. And she came in lo looking neither left nor right and proceeded directly to the staircase. So this is a woman that came there with a very clear sense of purpose. Like, she knew exactly what she was doing, heading straight there, and, you know, most people kind of, I don't know, most people look, I guess, when if you think about it. Okay, so here's where I would normally dismiss this. I would normally dismiss Mr. Ramsey as just, oh, whatever, it's just some guy that buttonholed the dude. But no, I did that last time, we can't make the same mistake. Mr. Ramsey might be the one responsible for everything. He could be. He could be. So, I'm going to write Mr. Ramsey. I'm going to put button holer. And I'm going to circle it. That's a big clue. Because really, this dude, who are we talking to? Oh, the day clerk who worked nights. He would have stopped... Francis from going upstairs like he would have because he said not non-residents are not allowed to pass without first stopping at the desk so he would have talked about this but Mr. Ramsey the buttonholer went straight up and buttonholed him so that's that's interesting okay and that gave somebody time enough to kill Guy Clarendon and frame Francis, okay? Necessary time, I guess. Um, there was a faint bang before the scream. Faint bang before scream. Which, of course, you probably think is a gunshot, but we need to go to the coroner to figure out 
how exactly he died. Because it's never really said he died of a gunshot wound. We will look into that. Don't worry. Um, she was totally disoriented. No idea where she was or what she had done. So she had complete memory loss. That tells me something narcotic. But finding that out is going to be real tough. Okay, so learn that the front doors are locked at 10 p.m. so that any guests or visitors must be let in by the night staff. Clarendon, leading a most exemplary life, was always in his rooms before 10. I don't know the significance of this paragraph. Oh, well, I guess... Oh. He was always in his room before 10, so nobody ever saw him leave. Or come back after 10. Which is what? Which is why he switched rooms to an alley suite where there were vines. Which led up the trellis. So he could sneak out of his room and come back in. Which, which, which I like the roll I'm on, I know. In his closets and dresser, he has two shirts, three pairs of shoes. Which are fencing shoes dyed black he's got a black sweater and black trousers all black sneaking out in the middle of the night he was up to some shit so he was up to some shit i'm gonna put up to shit i'm gonna circle that that's big clue all black all black sneaking out okay i'm we're piecing together. This was this is really good. I'm, I'm feeling good about this one. Okay, so I think that is everything then except for... Okay, so that's the room itself then. The sitting room walls are papered in a subdued floral pattern. The ceiling is covered with yellow plaster. The constable indicates the entryway to the bedroom is the place where the body was found. There's some blood on the carpet. A larger stain had apparently been made by the spilled contents of two wine glasses lying nearby, one shattered. In the center of the sitting room, some 15 feet away, are small flecks of yellow plaster. The center of the sitting room, some 15 feet away, are small flecks of the ceiling. So how did flecks of the ceiling get on the floor? Was the body moved, I guess is a good question. Why? Why would they move it 15 feet away or anything like that? I really got to think about this. Okay, blood on the carpet, sure, whatever. A larger stain had apparently been made by the spilled contents of two wine glasses. Okay, so he had two wine glasses set up. One shattered. So it shattered likely because someone broke it. But did they break it on purpose or did they break it as part of a scuffle? Was there a scuffle? What was the ceiling? What is the importance of the ceiling? How would flex... Someone would have to have damaged the ceiling. They didn't mention any bullet holes in the ceiling. Just flex of the ceiling on the carpet. He transferred from the third floor to the second floor. I I wonder if somebody something somebody engineered something on the floor above him perhaps. I don't know. There's really little to go off of on that. Okay, and then finally there's the bank note, which I don't think I can really decipher at this point. He withdrawed he withdrawed a lot of money first and then deposited a le like half the amount later. I don't know. He was hired to do a job, perhaps? I don't know. I, there's not enough to go there. I'll just write bank note for future reference. But okay, I think I want to go see the corner personally. Um, I need to know how this man died, because I doubt it's from a gunshot. 
And if it is from a gunshot, I want to just solidify that. Probably, if I were Sherlock Holmes, I would already know everything. The case would be done. I'd have 100 points. But I would know something from the damn newspaper as well. But And I could read the newspaper, but I want to go to the coroner. So um, we, will, we will head there, which is 38 EC. Oh, there it is. Um, at Bart's, Sir Jasper Meeks tells us that Clarendon was shot at very close range with a small caliber pistol. I received the body at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I would judge it being dead, dead anywhere from 4 to 10 hours. Which would be... Well, we already know when he was kind of shot. Or do we? Nothing really indicates that the bang and her scream were when he died. It could have been just her walking in. He could have been already dead when she arrived, but then somebody was there to knock her out. It doesn't really matter, though. Ten hours from one o'clock would be uh, 3 a.m., I think. Yes, something like that. So during the night, more or less. Or it could have been 10 o'clock in the afternoon or before noon, whatever, 10 in the morning. Hmm. Damn. Okay, so we know he was killed by a pistol, which we probably could have figured out, but the fact that it was never mentioned is kind of strange. Pistol. Okay. So let's think about it then. Where do I want to go? Who do I want to talk to? The Old Bailey is... a good idea, I would say. It's, it's, not, it's definitely not at the bottom of the list. So I need her account of what happened. So I would say that's likely what's going to happen. Uh, so I don't want the Old Bailey's Tribunal, the lawyer there. Is that where I'm going? Unless it's listed somewhere. Oh, it's the same location. Okay, yeah, that's where we're going. 36 EC, down the road, I guess. We'll see what she has to say, if we get to talk to her at even. I would hope so. Oh, here we go. Our interview with Edward Hall is very short. He knows little of the Clarendon murder, but with his connections, he is able to arrange an interview with Francis Nolan. Confined in a drab holding cell at the criminal court, Old Bailey, she is the picture of misery. Her eyes, her most attractive feature on an otherwise plain face, hold a great deal of confusion and disbelief at her present situation. I don't remember anything except seeing Guy's body across the room and the pistol in my hand. I screamed and I must have fainted. What? Oh, okay. I didn't even know that he was at Halliday's and I've never been there before. And why would I shoot him? We loved each other. Wiggins goes to her to calm her down. Yeah, picture it as much more, you know acting uh now let's take it one step at a time what is the last thing you remember before the room at halliday's going to bed the night before on sunday evenings dr trevelin dines with me at my home my sister loretta is under his care and these weekly meetings involve her progress well the doctor and i have become friends over the years dr trevelin left at 10 o'clock at 11 my maid grace prepared a cup of cocoa for me i drank it and read in bed for a short time then went to sleep that sounds really good right now how long have you known Guy Clarendon? I first met him at the country estate of Cornelius Oldwine in March. There was a party of some sort, and my sister climbed a 20-foot fountain and dived in. She caught pneumonia, and I had to go fetch her home. Guy was at the estate. And he immediately began paying court to you. No, in fact, he didn't seem to notice me. I was quite surprised some weeks later when he called. It was a lovely afternoon, May 10th. He apologized for his impertinence at calling without an appointment and asked permission to call again. We began seeing a good deal of each other and went for carnage ride. Carnage rides? The hell is that? What's a carnage ride? That's like Grand Theft Auto with a carriage, I guess. I don't know. Picnic lunches. He declared his love for me and asked my hand in marriage. I couldn't have killed him. How do you explain your presence at Halliday's? I can't. It's just like the other two times. You've had memory loss before? Yes, twice in the past month. The first time I found myself sitting on a bench in Hyde Park. 
It was late in the afternoon, and the last thing I remembered was having lunch with my sister. The second time occurred a few days later. That morning I had met with my solicitor, Hiram Davenport. That was the last thing I remember until I woke up again at the Liverpool Street Station. I consulted my doctor, Dr. Mason, and he was quite puzzled. He prescribed rest. Where did you acquire the pistol? I've never seen it before, even though the police assured me that it was mine. One last question. What is Gerald Locke to you? Jerry is an old dear friend. I'm afraid we've had a falling out of late. He said some very unkind words about Guy. Edward Hall catches up, us, up to us on our way out. He tells us that he has asked Wilford Roberts to take Miss Nolan's case. He's young, but he's already gained quite a reputation. Mark my words, he will be knighted someday. Okay. Shit. It's a lot of names and inter inter information. I have, again, a theory throwing around, and my last theory was kind of alright, but... Um, okay. She suffered... Okay. Think about this. Her and her sister went to a party in March... Her sister caught pneumonia, which she apparently still has. But no, 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 she can't. No, no, no she, that can't be possible. Because I, I'm, I'm really interested in what her sister's case is, or what her, her care that she needs. It said, my sister Loretta is under his care, and these weekly meetings involve her progress. Well, the doctor and I have become friends over the years. So what is up with Loretta. I need to know more about her because I feel like she's really pivotal in this case. Dr. Trevlin might be a suspect because she's had memory loss, which I said could be narcotic. Where do you likely get narcotics from? Doctors. We have two doctor names here. One is Dr. Trevlin, which she's known for years, and the other is Dr. Mason was very briefly mentioned and he just said was puzzled and prescribed to rest yeah that's bullshit dr mason but then also hiram davenport she met with this guy her solicitor hiram davenport and then she woke up at liverpool street station that's curious hiram davenport i think you're a sleazy shit um but then the, the first time that she lost memory, she was having lunch with her sister. I, I really feel like her sister is... I'm going to say suspect number one right now. That's what I'm putting out there. She might be a little crazy. I don't, Trevlin might be involved. I saw Goldeneye. I, I mean, there's, there's shit going down. So, my paper's really full, though. I don't know. I filled this thing up. Okay. Loretta. Suspect... Number one. Mental case? Is it mental or physical? I'm going to put mental case question mark. And then from that, I'll put Dr. Trevelin. We don't have a first name, and that really bugs me. But I don't think we need it for the uh, directory. Um, so I'm probably going to visit their estate next. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, so they went to this party. Her sister, I this is why I suspect it's mental, because her sister climbed a 20-foot fountain and dived in. That's, that's some jackass shit right there. You don't do that, especially at a party. I think she's crazy. So, weeks later, weeks later after that party, when this dude didn't even care to notice this chick, because she's kind of plain face. let's be honest, um, weeks later, he calls her up and is like, yo, baby, let's get it on. And so they did some carnage rides. I don't know what that is. That seems like something her sister would do. And he proposed, which I assume she, uh, she accepted. She didn't really say, but it seemed like it. Hmm. Hiram Davenport. He's on the list. I'm going to put Hiram Davenport shitbag. That's my hunch. I'll circle it. And I'm going to circle Loretta, too. It's, it's all shit. <laughs> okay, I think that is... 
But Gerald is also, also a suspect. But, yeah, he is still a suspect because he wants Guy, he doesn't want, he wants Guy dead. He said all this shit about him. He wants Francis Nolan. I don't know why. Probably money, but whatever. He wants Francis Nolan. So he sets this whole thing up. Memory loss, all that. Who knows what. Guy's dead, but she's framed for it. So he wants to get her off the hook. So he goes to the best detective in the entire world. That doesn't make much sense. I don't know. He's very low on the suspect list, but he could just be a complete dumbass. So I don't know. Um, I'll put suspect question mark. I won't even circle it. It's not even a circleable thing. Um, okay, so really, this is the key thing, I think, right here. The last thing she remembers is drinking a cup of cocoa and falling asleep. And then she was in the room with a pistol, and he's on the floor dead. What the hell was in that cocoa? That's really the... Because every time... Well, I guess I don't know what Hiram Davenport did, but both times she was at eating a meal or something like that, you know, consuming something. So, Dr. Trevelyan left at 10 o'clock. At 11, my maid prepared a cup of cocoa for me. I think the maid's in on it. I think Dr. Trevelyan's in on it. I think there's some shit going down. So, the question is, do we go visit Dr. Trevelyan first or the estate? Um, I guess if I can look up Trevelyan in here and I see it, we'll go there. He's got some splaining to do. Trevelyan, Trevelyan, Dr. Percy. Oh, yeah, boy. 4WC. We could just solve this case right here. We just catch him jerking off onto a pile of money or something. I don't know, man. I don't know. Actually, I don't know if that would solve the case, but it would help. Uh, wait a minute. Where the hell is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, damn it. It's really short. Dr. Trevlin's manservant greets us at the door back bedecked in apron and carrying a broom as he tells us that dr trevlin is at his office a street cat attempts to dodge into the house with a swipe of the broom worthy of a professional cricketer he sends the cat flying back into the street and meowing away at his office i didn't go to his office why would i not go to his office i didn't want to go to his damn house but his offices aren't listed i don't think so no. I mean, is it listed under O? It's probably not listed at all. They don't want you to find this douche. Because it's not going to be listed under doctor. That would be ridiculous. I'm probably not ever going to be able to talk to this man. Which seems really bullshit. Um... Because if it wasn't under his last name, it's not going to be in here. Damn. Double damn. Unless, hold on. No, they list doctor's offices. But it's just going to be his, yeah. Wait a minute. That's a different address. 19SW, we're going there. Aha! I got you, you bastard. Oh, all right, decently long here. Here we go. Dr. Trevlin is an athletic-looking man, and everything about him, his movements and gestures, is very precise. His eyes are piercing and vivacious, and seem to read the depths of your soul. What the? He's near Lethotep. I don't know. It is ever so slightly disturbing. He drops himself into the chair behind it. Oh, actually, this doesn't have anything to do with this. I'm sorry, but since I mentioned near Lethotep in this, there's actually a fan-made um, spin-off that uses this very same setup. All It's basically consulting detective, but in uh, the Lovecraft universe. It's called like Arkham Mystery or Arkham, something like that. And uh, apparently it's going to get published officially at some point, and I will play through that, and it will be amazing. But anyways. He drops himself into the chair behind his desk, fiddles with his pocket watch, and asks how he can help us. We understand that you dined with Francis Nolan on the evening of July 1st. Yes, that is correct. We dine every Sunday. Her sister, Loretta, has been under my care for some ten years, first at the Mesmer Braid Institute and then in private practice. I meet with Miss Francis weekly to keep her informed of her sister's progress. 
What began as a purely clinical exercise has ripened into a pleasant evening between friends. Let me say that it is difficult to believe that Miss Francis committed this deed. She has a quiet, unassuming personality. One might describe her, albeit unkindly, as mousy. An act of such direct compensation would not be at all in keeping with her character. Are she and her sister close? They lead very different and separate lives. Miss Francis leaves a quiet life, while Miss Loretta's is wild and flamboyant. Francis stays at home. Loretta never misses a party. Their individual laughs illustrate their differences. Francis's is timid, no more than a titter. Loretta's laugh is deep and resounding, totally uninhibited. For her part, Miss Francis loves and cares for her sister as a parent would a child. Miss Loretta, while well, she often seeks refuge with her sister and loves her as much as she is capable of love. Thank you, doctor. Okay. My suspicions were correct that Loretta was the woman that frequently visited uh, Guy Clarendon. And, yeah, okay. Does that answer anything, though? Not really. That's just confirming my suspicion. Also, this doesn't indicate Dr. Trevelyan is having anything to do with really anything. So, really, we have to go to the Nolan estate. We need to take pay a visit. And see what's going down. Hopefully we can meet. Uh... Oh actually they live in separate houses. They are listed separately. Francis and Loretta. I don't think going to Francis's house. Will prove anything. We'll put that lower on the list. But we're going to see Loretta. We've got to see this wild wild crazy girl. You know. You know. Where the hell was it? Oh 21 SW. Okay. Oh, it's actually the next one on the list, believe it or not. <laughs> a man dressed as if he had, step had stepped from the pages of the Tales of Arabian Nights, curved scimitar and all, bars our interest to Loretta Nolan's home. Wow. This sounds like an RPG. Shoot him in the face. Only when it is established that we are not tradesmen collecting for goods or services are we allowed to pass. <laughs> We enter the parlor to find Miss Loretta lacining on large silk pillow clad in a costume similar to her servant's, that is, a man's Arabian outfit. To add to the motif, long swatches of brightly colored material are draped about the room on red cords. By appearances, we might have entered a Pasha's tent. Enter and be recognized, she commands, lifting her head from the hookah on which she is puffing. It must be our look of total disbelief which causes her to break out with peals of deep, unrestrained laughter. When we do not respond, except perhaps to shift from foot to foot to indicate our discomfort, her laugh abruptly dies and her mouth pauses in a pout. Oh, you do not wish to play. Very well. She is suddenly on her feet and flying around the room, whisking away the cloth. Plopping down in a chair that was hidden by the material, she tells us to state our business. You do not seem at all upset by Mr. Clarendon's death and your sister's arrest. She takes a long moment to answer, staring off into nothingness. Guy was fun to be with. My sister, she is an innocent among the lions. Before we can ask a question, she rises and calls her butler. I believe I will be going out this evening, Randall. She sweeps out of the room, leaving us standing alone. She's just crazy. It doesn't tell us anything. No, there's a third party here. There's definitely somebody that set us this all up. I think it's her Hiram, Hiram Davenport. He's a bastard and he's working with that buttonholer mr ramsey all right davenport i'm on to you unless ramsey has a location listed but why would he be at the hotel i don't know but i'm looking it up ramsey 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 oh there is a ramsey in here i don't know if it's the same guy but it's herman ramsey you're on my shit list buddy you can't just go around town buttonholing whoever you please this is london uh, Davenport. Davenport. Hear him. 1NW. He is so dead. Kill him. Uh, 1NW. One 1NW. One oh, damn it! It's like one sentence. The housekeeper informs us that Mr. Davenport is at his office. Why? Oh. Is this even listed? Solicitors? That's not even, like, a thing. It would require me to really think about what a solicitor does. Um, tobacconist? That's not it. Synagogue? It's not there. Uh, 
Um, what is it? Oh, solicitors. It is here. Hiram Davenport, 13 WC. God, why don't I look there first? That's two locations now that I lost points on. And I'm I'm on his trail. Oh, oh, oh yeah. All right, it's it's all right, Long. After waiting nearly two hours, we are finally shown into Hiram Davenport's office. He apologizes for the delay with a somewhat suspect sincerity. And we take our seats and ask our questions. Yes, I am Francis's solicitor and Loretta's too, although I am less help in that direction since she came of age. You handled their father's estate? That's correct. Their father left them equal shares in his one-third share of the Aberdeen Navigation Company. I administered that bequest in the form of a trust fund until each girl came of age. Since then, I have tried to do my best to advise them. With one-sixth of a share of Aberdeen Navigation Company, they must be very wealthy. Francis is, to be sure, but Loretta saw fit, much against my advice, I might add, to liquidate her stock. I'm afraid her financial situation is not at all it could be. Do you recall a meeting with Miss Francis last month when she blacked out? He looks puzzled a moment, then offers, Well, I did meet with both Miss Francis and Miss Loretta last month, and Miss Francis did leave unexpectedly. I thought it out at the time, but she did not black out as such. Would you describe the meeting? We were in the middle of our discussion when I was called away on other important business. I begged their indulgence and stepped out of the office. I was gone, oh, 20 minutes. When I got back, Miss Francis had a very strange look in her eyes, said, Thank you very much, nice to see you again, or something to that effect, and left. Miss Loretta laughed that very disturbing laugh of hers and left also. Thank you. Miss, she's drugging them, man. She's drugging her own sister to try and set this up so she can get some money. And I don't know where she's getting the drugs. There's only one other doctor. And that is Dr. Mason. I don't know if I even wrote that down. Is that really my next lead? Is that my best bet? We really got to think about it. Dr. Gerald Mason. I don't know. What else do I have? What other, what other names do I have? Gerald Locke. That's possible. Let's just check the newspaper, shall we? Let's, let's see if we can read some shit. Um, blah, blah, blah. There's some births. There's some marriages that I don't care about. Yeah, deaths. Nothing I really care about. Uh, there's a ad. Wait, what? A depot for fire escapes and fire extinguishers. Is this an ad? Oh, it's an advertisement. I thought it was under the death section. Oh, here, here's something interesting about Holmes' case. It says, J.M. to all concerned. And he cast down the pieces of silver and went and hanged himself. Matthew 27, 5. Interesting. F.R. Tomorrow, look at the moon. Mr. and Mrs. Francis J. Bailey returned sincere thanks to their friends and acquaintances for their kind inquiry since their carriage accident. Okay. Matthew 27, 5. I'm going to write that down just in case it's a question at the end. That's at bonus points, man. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Nothing there. Writer's cramp. No... Breakfast in bed. Locks. John Bull. Entertainment. Oh, there's the Royal Italian Circus. Which apparently some guy died. Sporting. Guns. Pheasants. Coaching season. Cricket, blah, 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 society burglar still at large, mm-hmm, lady leads, okay, something about to the editor, mm-hmm, okay, Human hair, why it falls off. Nobody cares about that. 
So far, this is not helping me at all. No, no, nothing on that side. Society bur more about the society burglar. Here's a good thing to wonder. Was Guy Clarendon the society burglar? Now we got to think about that. Should I read it? That elusive and so far successful burglar, commonly known as a society burglar, has gotten away with jewels valued at 14000 currency by the seven victims to date. Speculation continues as to the identity of the burglar who seems to be acquainted with the various and sometimes ingenious hiding places of his victim's jewels. The other striking aspects of the modus operandi are the taking of only one select piece each time and the occurrence of all thefts when the victims are not at home. We provided for the interest of our readers a list of the various jewels stolen and their values. Ah, uh, ooh. Ah, uh, ooh. Hold on, go back to that banknote. This is interesting. I mean, we're assuming he's getting like a one-for-one -one value here, but the values do line up. Although I don't know how this works. June... Okay. So right before the society burglar stole for the first time, the day before, actually, he, Guy Clarendon, withdrawed $5,000. 5,000 pounds. I'm going to call him dollars because I live in America, buddy. These numbers don't all add up, but it could have been multiple bank accounts. He stole, the first thing that he stole was worth $500. And the third thing he stole was worth 2000 The final thing that he stole was worth 5000 I don't know if that all adds up, but this is really interesting. I'd be very curious. And the fact that all this information is provided, which is strange, um, piques my interest. There was another section about it, right? Um, what did it say? After a month of jewelry burglaries from some of London's most fashionable homes, Scotland Yard reports little progress in the identification and apprehension of the so-called society burglar. The victim of the latest theft, Lady Leeds, has become so overwrought by the invasion of her bedroom by this unknown man and by the loss of her prized diamond tiara that she has been hospitalized at the suggestion of her physician. Though any impetus to attack the increasing problem of crime should be welcome, it is unfortunate that impetus comes more strongly when the class of victims is expanded. I don't know. It's I'm, I would be going out on a limb, but I really want to go to her house. Even though she's hospitalized, but I'm going to look it up. This is my gambit, kind of. If this doesn't prove anything, then I have to kind of abandon that thought line. But uh, there are three leads... Oh, no, there are two leads. Kevin leads and Sir Sanford leads. I would imagine it's Sir. Um, so 30 SW. Let's do it. You never know. Oh, sure enough. It's right here. And it's actually... It's not too bad. Sir Sanford lead, leads expresses his hope that his wife's tiara will soon be recovered. It is a valuable piece to be sure, but more than that, my wife has been under a doctor's care since its theft and just yesterday took up a room at St. George's Hospital. She's even more overwrought than when young Clarendon poured champagne down the uh, hembodis of her Paris original at the Richmond's party on the 20th past, which, come to think of it, was the last time she wore the tiara. Oh, my God! <laughs> Where was the tiara kept? At the bottom drawer of the bureau, under some of my wife's ahem, more frilly garments. Were there signs of extensive search, drawers left open, that sort of thing? No, the burglar knew right where to look, it seems. You were not at home, correct? That's correct. My first night out since the rich men's party. Down with La Grip. Down with La Grippa. What? Still not in top form, but couldn't miss the old regiment's annual wingding. Thank you, Sir Sanford. We wish Lady Leeds a speedy recovery. Recover the tiara and she'll come right around. Okay. This is crazy when i read clarendon's name i was like what okay so clarendon was a shitbag right i mean i don't have that the uh, hiram was the shitbag but clarendon shitbag has this party 
meets a bunch of women, fancy women, eyes up the ones that have the nice shit going on, and then goes to their home, does the nasty, I assume, finds out where they keep their shit, goes back, steals their shit right off the bat. Or he knocks them out somehow while he's doing the nasty and then steals it and they don't remember something like that. I don't know. 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 I don't, I, I don't know. But Clarendon, he's got to be the society burglar. The question is, what do I do with this information? We need somebody that's in the know on the underground business, the criminal underground. We need somebody. Here, Porky Shinwell. He'll know what he'll know what's going on. He owns the Raven and Rat Tavern, source of information for all illegal affairs and on all criminals. This guy's gonna know something. 52 EC. We are on something now, man. Okay, okay, okay. 52 EC. I'm excited. This is like solving real crimes. Oh yeah, here we go. Oh, of course I knew Clarendon. He and his lady friend stopped in from time to time. They were usually on their way to Kilgore's gaming parlor or coming back from it, says Porky Shinwell. What's Kilgore's gaming parlor? Ha ha, it's a nice little place down in the southeast, frequented by swells and toffs. Copper's been trying to close it down for years, but Kilgore knows when they come within three blocks. Clarendon was into him for a sizable sum, or so it was said. 7,000 pounds, okay, pounds, was the figure I heard. Got to the point that Kilgore wouldn't allow him in his place. I understand Clarendon didn't take too kindly to that. Almost caused a row until Kilgore's right-hand man, Gus Bullock, stepped in. Clarendon backed down. I don't blame him none. Gus is a mean character right enough. There's a joke about Gus. Somebody once said he'd like to see the customer who gave Gus that scar. He was told, so would the fellow's widow. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyway, Kilgore made it clear that he expected the money and there were bad feelings all around. Then maybe a month or so later, Clarendon shows up all smiles and he and Hil Kilgore getting on like brothers. Figure Clarendon must have paid him back. Then Calvin Leach steps into the picture. Who's Calvin Leach? Well, rumor has it that Leach deals in what you might call stolen property. Square dealer, too. Give you one half the value of the article. Now, Calvin Leach don't usually associate with the likes of Claude Kilgore. But there it is. Leach, Kilgore, and Clarendon meeting late at night, just as thick as a fog. Haha. <laughs> the meetings continued on and right up until, well, the night before Clarendon's death. Did these meetings take place at the Raven and Rat? Well, I won't say they did, I won't say they didn't. We'll say, though, everything I told you is as true as if it was written in the good book. Now, we've been standing here, John, and I don't hear nobody ordering a pint or nothing. What it'll be. Okay. Okay, so we can write down our visitor names, then. We have, the first is Loretta. We know that. Or the second was Loretta, whatever. First was Gus Bullock. Okay. And we have, then, this sheet of paper looks intense, man. But, okay. Guy Clarendon owed money to Kilgore. We don't have a last name for Kilgore, but it doesn't matter. Kilgore's Gaming Parlor. Okay, okay, okay. So he owes 7,000 pounds, which is quite a bit. He steals stuff. And then they bring in this guy, Calvin Leach, who's a square dealer, and gives one half the value of the article. Okay, 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 okay. Let's go back to this bank now that we can match these values now, which is unnecessary, but I want to do it anyways. Uh, so one half. Where the hell is, where, where the hell, where, where the hell is it? Is this it? This is it. <laughs> okay. So June 1st, he withdrawed 5,000. Why? I don't know. It's not really said. Where the hell was I? Why did I switch pages? I was reading that. Uh, doesn't say when. A month later. I'm going to assume this is May when he was owed the money or something like that. Okay, so 
He starts stealing stuff. He doesn't deposit everything, because that's unnecessary. So he steals this pin, he gets 250 for it. Steals a bracelet, he gets 750 for it. So he's at one grand. He steals a bracelet, he gets a grand for it. So he's up to two grand. But then he steals two more things and gets another 2,000. He deposits that 2,000 the day after he steals that necklace. Then he gets another 500 and he deposits that 500. So if we if we just started from the 11th of June, everything lines up where he deposits that half of the money. Then he steals the diamond tiara, gets 2,500 for it, and somewhere along the line he's all paid up. Maybe if I add up all those values, 250s, okay, so that's 1,000, that's 2,000, 250, uh, 4,000, 450, yes, that is exactly 7,000 actually. Everything that he stole came to exactly 7,000 for his, his profit from the guy. Okay, so that, yeah, that all makes sense. So we need to go to Kilgore's Parlor. Oh, man, this is sweet. This is going much better, I think. I mean, I've wasted a lot of locations, but I, I'm feeling really good about it. I feel much smarter that I made this leap of calculation that he's actually uh, the, the, the burglar. Kilgore, Claude, that's his home residence. I don't want his home residence. I mean, maybe I do, but I'd rather have the gaming parlor. Furriers? I don't want no furrier. Uh, inns of jeweler, embassies, govern gunsmiths, books, boarding houses, car charities. No. Cocoa manufacturers? No. Is it not going to be listed? How do I find this guy? Maybe I want Leech. Do I want Leech? Is Leech listed? Calvin Leech. Let's go there. It's on the list. Let's go there. Calvin. Calvin Coolidge. Uh, 16SE. Uh, yeah. Wiggins, disguised to the point of being almost unrecognizable, meets us by pre-arrangement at the corner of Penton Place and Kennington Park Road. Leech is what Porky said he was, a dealer in stolen goods. He looked at me funny when I mentioned Clarendon, said he didn't know him. God damn it. Okay, so it's it's got to be Kilgore then. And I think I have to go to his home residence. Because there's no Kilgore's gaming. There's just Claude Kilgore, so that's where we're going. I, I, I guess. 21 SE. A man... Oh, no, that's SW. Sorry. S-E. 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 Claude Kilgore is a very smooth customer. He admits to knowing Clarendon, but has no idea who Calvin Leach is, or so he says. God damn it, I just wasted like 10 points. We're still not putting everything together. That doesn't really matter, though, that we solve that he's the society burglar. It doesn't solve anything. Because it's just whatever. I mean, that was like his side thing. That's not why he was murdered. Because he paid the guy back. Everything was good. Like, do I want to go to this Bullock houses? This this Bullock guy? That's not going to solve anything. Is he even listed? Bullock. I don't think he is, actually. It must not be his real name. So really, that's nothing. I mean, it will probably be a question at the end, so I can get some points. But that doesn't solve anything. We're really not anywhere where we need to be. So walking through it one more time. Loretta is suspect number one, but how she did it is really the key here. 
Loretta, crazy, wild, wasted all her money. She liquidated her stock, everything. Francis, mousy, more respectable, knew what she was doing, has a lot of money. Loretta wants Francis's money. Loretta's crazy. Loretta finds a way to drug Francis multiple times. Why she had to do it multiple times is not clear to me. Who or how or what is going on with the drugs? I assume it has to be drugs. She had to have been narked somehow. Something had to happen there. I believe I went to both doctors. No, I didn't go to the Mason. I don't know. He didn't seem like... It didn't seem like a suspect. What names am I not inspected? Mr. Ramsey. Do I want... I guess, yeah, Mr. Ramsey is actually still a key suspect. He's a key buttonholer. Where is he? Where's that shitbag? Ramsey. Ram Herman Ramsey. Let's go. That's all I got. 32 WC. I'm on to you, buttonholer. It's going to be like my new freaking catchphrase or something. I don't know. 32 WC. It is actually not here. Must be a different guy or I'm completely off base with the buttonholer. So we will erase that. That didn't happen. Nothing happened there. Okay, so shit. Really, he's not a suspect. Damn you, Ramsey. Okay, then there is... We can go to Francis' home. That's pretty nice. Or we can go to Clarendon's home, which is also nice. Is Clarendon listed? Does that solve anything? I don't think Clarendon... No, Clarendon's not a suspect. He's dead, man. Come on. Going to his house wouldn't prove anything. So I think going to Francis' house might... I think it's possible she did commit the murder, but not of her own will. Uh, Nolan, 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 Nolan. Nolan, 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 Nolan. Nolan. 46 WC. Okay, it's here. We speak to Miss Francis' maid, Grace, who tells us that on the evening of the 1st, Dr. Trevlin was at the Nolan home until 10 o'clock. After Dr. Trevlin left, Miss Francis asked for a cup of cocoa, and I brought it to her. As I came up the stairs to retire, the light in Miss Francis' room went out. The hall dock below struck the hall hour... Or maybe that's a B. Is there a ball hour? I don't know. The ball dock below. That's funnier, I guess. The ball dock below struck the ball hour. That would be 11.30. I did wake up in the middle of the night. Actually, it was almost morning. I thought I heard something. I listened for a time, but heard nothing more and dozed off again. I rose at 7.30, completed my toilet by 8, and went downstairs to prepare Miss Francis' breakfast. No sooner was I in the kitchen than I heard the front door open and close. I saw Miss Francis walking down the street. I didn't know what to think when I heard the news, except not to believe it. Miss Francis wouldn't harm anyone, especially Mr. Clarendon. Do you think I might be able to see her? I'd like to take her spectacles and a book or two. She is so fond of reading, you know. Ah, God, that doesn't really prove anything. I know she's drugged. But I guess the timing is interesting. Walking down the street at 8 in the morning. I thought the crime, the murder happened at night. Or was I completely off base there? Um, nine o'clock. Oh, it did happen in the morning. Oh, okay. So could it have even been the cocoa? Shit, I don't know. I mean, that's a delayed reaction. Damn, 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 damn. I don't know. Is there anybody? I guess I can go to Holmes. We can go to Holmes for assistance. But at this point in the thing... I feel like he's only going to tell me clues that I already know. And really, if you go to him, you're just wasting five points, more or less. But it does give us some form of help. That's possible, but also Clarendon's is... 
on the... But he wouldn't have a residence in London because he was staying at the damn hotel. He actually does have a residence. It doesn't make any sense. We're going there. 31 SW. Yep. Oh, it's nice and long. Sir Francis Clarendon is a severe old man, deeply disappointed in his only son. He was a wastrel and a ne'er-do-well. Only a month or so ago, I gave him £5,000, okay, and told him it was the last he'd see of my money. I hoped the shock would bring the boy around, make him realize that he had to settle down and carve out a life for himself. Enough of this shilly shillaline. The gambling out to all hours of the night with the wild woman. He was breaking his poor mother's heart. Wild woman? Why do you mean? What do you mean? That Nolan girl. Francis Nolan? No, no, that sister of hers, that Loretta. You mentioned gambling. Do you know with whom your son gambled or who might have wanted to kill him? No, I'm sorry. He told us nothing. He only came around when he needed money, and since I told him there would be no more money, I'd hardly see him. Just breaking his mother's heart, he was. Gertrude Clarendon sits sobbing in the corner, her heart breaking indeed. Don't waste your tears on him, Gertie. He wasn't worth it. So saying, his own eyes begin to mist over. We quietly take our leave, and the butler follows us out the front door. Maybe I can help. Master Guy was a wild one, but he wasn't all bad. Please, we'd appreciate any help. About five weeks ago, I noticed a man hanging about, a very formidable-looking character. He had an ugly scar down the side of his face and was dressed rather carelessly, which is what attracted my attention. He just did not belong, if you know what I mean. Did he approach the door or did you see him with the young Clarendon? Neither. He just walked up and down the street for most of the evening. I was certain, however, that he had a special interest in the house. Late that night, or rather early the next morning, for I remember hearing the ball dock chime three times, I heard a clatter in the house and came to investigate. I'm a very light sleeper, and I was on my guard anyway because of the man with the scar. In any case, it was Master Guy, and he was in a terrible state. He was all battered and bruised, and there was a fresh cut on his forehead. I asked him point blank who had done it to him. He didn't answer directly, just told me I shouldn't forget about it, not to mention it to anyone. That may be, This may be a big help, thanks. It's actually not a big help. None of this really was. God. Yeah, I have to go to Sherlock. I, I'm out. I was so... I was on a roll so well. You guys remember it. It was sweet. It was sweet. But... It's fleeting, man. It's fleeting in this game. <sighs> Nothing seems to be able to pull Holmes out of the melancholic mood in which he was when we left. I have much to do before nightfall, Wiggins. I won't be able to spare you much time. The first thing to do is verify Miss Francis Nolan's version of the facts. Mr. Locke's attitude clearly involves jealousy towards Clarendon. If Miss Nolan is in love with Clarendon, it seems completely absurd for her to kill him. If she didn't pull the trigger, then who did? The examination of the crime scene could surely give you clues. Don't hesitate to make a sketch of the scene. It often helps in thinking. And of course, there's the question of the motive. Who would want to eliminate Clarendon and Francis at the same time? As it's, of course, the death sentence that awaits Miss Nolan for her so-called crime, it's all I can give you the hand for leads at the moment, gentlemen. Now I'll have to let you go as urgent business awaits me. He's right, of course. The motive is the big question. You'd assume Loretta to be the motive for dealing with her sister because that would put all the money potentially in her hands although i don't know how that works but if she hung out with clarendon a lot why would she want to kill him but again she is crazy so i can't really worry about that too much so the question is again how did loretta pull this off And really, my visit to Loretta gave me nothing. Because I've... I don't know. I don't know who else to go to. I've gone through almost every name. More or less. Where was the no Loretta Nolan section? Maybe there was some clue there that I missed. Okay, so this dude has a scimitar. He's dressed like an Arabian knight, whatever. I think this whole thing is just to show how batshit insane she is. Guy was fun to be with. My sister, she's an innocent among the lions. That's what she says. We really have so little to go off in incriminating her. Other, like I can't just say, oh, she's batshit insane. I think we need to pay a visit to Gerald. 
Gerald would have motive for Guy, but he definitely wouldn't have motive for her, unless he's really crazy about Loretta, but that doesn't make any sense. But he is on the list. We're out of ideas. Let's pay him a visit. Gerald Locke, 34 WC. I have no idea how much time I have left. I don't know how long I've been doing this. Just kind of go with the flow. 34 WC. Gerald Locke is not very helpful to our investigation, not because he does not wish to be, but simply because he has no information to impart. Of course. <sighs> um... I, I want to suspect Hiram more than I am. I think I went to his office, right? I didn't go to his home. He might, there might be something at his home. But really, I'm reaching at that point. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try it. We'll try it. <laughs> Again, I'm probably going to get negative points. So, one NW. It's going to say, oh, uh, Hiram is at his office right now. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, the housekeeper informs us that Mr. Davenport is at his office. Didn't I already go here? Did I already go here? I did already go here. I'm, a, I'm erasing that. You can't go somewhere twice. That's my bad memory. Actually, that's me not looking at my list. Yeah, because I remember I did that thing twice. Okay. Uh, shit. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where to go. I guess I look at this list. Is there anything here? There's the criminologist. Oh, you need substances. Maybe he knows about this flakes. Remember those flakes on the ceiling from the ceiling? I don't know, man. Give me something to work off of. Entering his laboratory, we are initially unable to locate H.R. Murray in his maze of chemical paraphernalia, file cabinets, and boxes until Wiggins notices a faint snore coming from the far corner. We walk over and find him hunched on his desk, asleep with a pile of criminal reports and chemistry notes as a pillow. Wiggins taps him on the shoulder. He jerks upright, and his white hair and the white papers mingle in a temporary flurry around his head. Hello, what? Oh my, where? Oh yes, it's you, Higgins. I must have dozed off. What are you up to today? It's Wiggins, sir, and we're looking into the Clarendon murder. Clarendon? I just finished that report when I fell asleep. Let's see, number 301, 301. He rummages through his pile of papers, although we wonder how a report he'd just written could be anywhere but on top. Ah, here it is, 301, Clarendon, guy. Not much, I'm afraid. A hole in the shirt where a small caliber bullet passed into the body. Extensive blood powder burns, indicating a close-range shot. Ah, here's something interesting. On the lower part of the shirt, I found traces of alcohol. Wine, to be exact. I have a good nose, and I believe it's an inferior quality Italian red. I was in Italy, and blah, blah, blah. We tip off and miss his lecture on the chemical quality of finer wines. Okay, Italian wines. Okay, he had wine set up in his suite, but why? Was he celebrating? Who would he celebrate? Probably Loretta, but if Loretta's the suspect... But is she the suspect? Even That's not even a clue at all. What can I do with that information? I feel like every one of these cases now, I get to a point where it's just, I don't know. And I have nothing to go off of. Do I just go to random addresses until I find something? Scotland Yard, we're going there. What do we got? The Strat, he's always a wealth of information. As is often the case, agitation reigns in the offices of Scotland Yard. While trying to avoid Agent Pierce, who is rushing down the corridor, we literally pushed, literally pushed into the office of a certain Inspector Herberts. Totally, M. Kilgore, you must. One moment. Excuse me, sirs, what's going on? Come on, get out. Don't you see that I'm on the phone? Confused, we apologize and exit the office. We quickly head to the office of Inspector Lestrade. It's a useless inquiry, says a harried Inspector Lestrade. And look, Frances Nolan claims not to have known that Clarendon was residing in Halliday's, yet she proceeds directly to his room. She fired a shot from a derringer, for which she had a receipt from S. Goff in her name, 
In the room where Clarendon was found dead, shot with a small caliber pistol. No, the lady's unquestionably guilty. Okay, we have another name. S. Goff. Let's look up gunsmiths or something. Right? He's a, that would be a gunsmith. S. Goff. 28 WC. It's a clue. Go! Yeah, you're right, though. It is curious. What kind of narcotic would make somebody walk to a place she didn't even know he was staying at and then kill him and then wake up? Like it's, that's a hell of a narcotic. Perhaps it's some kind of hypnosis thing. I don't know. How can I even work off of that? 28, 28, 28, WC? That's actually not even in the book. Damn. I will erase it. Huh. I guess that wouldn't be a clue at all. But it has to be a clue. She... She didn't even know she owned the gun. But no, that's really, that's it for Goff. It's just the, the gunsmith, and it's not in the book, so it can't be a clue. That's crazy. If it were me in real life, I would go there. All right, well, then I have nothing to go off of. Oh, man. Shit. I hate this. I don't know. I don't know what to do. This is usually where I, I, I guess I end it. And I try to solve it. <sighs> Damn. I thought I really had something going on. Alright. Let's see what we got then. Questions. Number one. Who killed Guy Clarendon? Uh, Loretta Nolan. Or do I want to suspect that Francis did it. Nah, we'll stick with Loretta. Why was he murdered? Um, why was he murdered? That's a damn fine question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase it. I'm gonna put Francis Nolan. I put Francis Nolan cheating with her sister. Why not? It really it makes much more sense now that I think about it. Why would Loretta really want him dead? Why did Francis Nolan go to the Halliday Hotel? Kill Guy. Four. Who is the society burglar? Guy Clarendon. Who's Calvin Leach? He's a he's a square dealer. Bought from Guy. I don't know. You guys know what I mean, so it'll be fine. Who killed Klaus Wallenden and how? I don't know. In which neighborhood did Kenward Olick work in? I don't know. How did Kilgore manage to evade the police vigilance? Um, disguises. I don't know. I don't know any of those miscellaneous questions. Okay, solution. We are at 221B Baker Street trying to sort out a solution. Holmes enters the apartment. His appearance is startling. His cap is gone. His trousers are spattered with mud and his jacket is ripped. Even more disturbing is the stark look of defeat in his eyes. Without a word, he shuffles over to the basin to splash his grimy face with water. Holmes, says Watson softly. We're having a devil of a time with this case. Could you help us? Holmes stiffens and after a moment lets out a long sigh. As he turns back to us, his features soften until a faint trace of a smile plays at the corner of his mouth. Of course, Watson, he says, matching Watson's subdued tone. How can I be of service to you? For the next 20 minutes, Watson acquaints Holmes with the facts of Guy Clarendon's murder by taking him on a verbal tour of our visits around the city. When Watson is finished, Holmes takes the floor. Excellent, Watson. You've managed to solve two cases for Scotland Yard, though I doubt Lestrade will consider himself in your debt. I have? 
Yes, indeed. Clarinet is 7,000 pounds in debt to the gambler Kilgore. Unfortunately, he's out of pocket and his father's bad graces. Kilgore's confederate, the dangerous Gus Bullock, is seen hanging about the Clarendon home, and the younger Clarendon is roughed up. To solve his problem, Clarendon turns to burglary. His victims are to be members of his own clans, whose social comings and goings he knows well, and whose homes he has visited. He acquires a black sweater and trou- black trousers, dyes a pair of canvas fencing shoes, and decides he needs a base of operations. It may well have been Bullock's lurking presence to spawn his desire to secret himself away. In any case, he chose Halliday's. Clarendon arrives at Halliday's and takes a day to look the place over. Significantly, he switches rooms to one in the back part of the hotel, with a vine-covered trellis conveniently leading to the bedroom window. Now, on the 1st of June, Bullock, having discovered Clarendon's elegant hideaway, confronts him in the lobby. The £5,000 given to him by his father is withdrawn and makes its way to Kilgore against the debt. That evening, the society burglar strikes for the first time. Clarendon, Kilgore, and Calvin Leach, a known trafficker in stolen goods, are seen in company. Notice, if you will, that one half the value of the first three society thefts amounted to £2,000, one half the value being the price normally paid by Leach for stolen goods, and equals the balance of Clarendon's debt to Kilgore. Debt-free, Clarendon is now in position to make money on his own as a succeeding bank transaction is evident. On the day after each of the next three burglaries, Clarendon made deposits. The pattern of the burglaries is obvious. Clarendon would pick his target, select the knight, and contact Leech. That evening, he would enter Halliday's well before 10 o'clock in order to establish an alibi, change into his working clothes, and exit down the trellis. Burglary accomplished, he would return, change again, and meet with Leech. The next day, he would dispose his, deposit his take. The pattern was interrupted on the night of July 1st, the night of the theft of the Cleopatra tiara. Loretta Nolan, a longtime accomplice of Clarendon in various nefarious misdeeds, was aware of the burglaries and quite proudly took part in them. Her recognizable laugh revealed her presence at the Halliday. A short time after the four, fifth burglary, two thefts were planned. One thought up by Clarendon concerned the theft of Cleopatra's tiara, the other was planned by Dr. Trevelin. Indeed, the good doctor who had been, who had been taking care of Loretta for years thought, through hypnosis, has also learned of the dark behavior of Clarendon during a seance with his patient. He saw there the chance to get rid of a bothersome rival who risked getting his hands on Francis' fortune, which he also wants for himself. On the night of July 1st, he entered Clarendon's bedroom by the trellis, armed with a derringer, and awaited his return. Clarendon came back from his night work, and while he was pouring himself a glass of wine to celebrate the event, Trevelin killed him and used the occasion to take the loot from the last theft, Cleopatra's tiara. During that night, he then went to visit Francis. Knowing perfectly the technique and thanks to the drugs he administered to her under the pretense of giving her a sedative, he hypnotized her. Didn't I just say that shit? He ordered her to go into Clarendon's bedroom, the derringer, and fire into the ceiling. God damn it! With Clarendon removed and Francis getting a death sentence, the fortune of the latter was naturally destined to Loretta. It would have been child's play for Trevelyn to profit from the mental weakness of Loretta to bilk her out of the money, even more so since Clarendon was no longer there to push her into costly extravagances. If you would please let Lestrade know, I'm sure you'll find Dr. Trevelyn still in possession of Cleopatra's tiara. Holmes sighs deeply and appears suddenly weary. The spark of energy and interest ignited by Watson's plea for help is all but extinguished. He sits in a minute, a moment in silence, looking down at his own tattered appearance. No doubt his failure to solve the cabbie's murder preys upon his mind. Finally, he starts toward his room, mumbling, I believe I will clean up now. At the doorway, he stops and whispers, Watson, the needle. Ugh. Okay, he visited five leads. Halliday's Hotel, Old Bailey, Dr. Trevelin, Hiram Davenport. Oh, he did go to Hiram Davenport and Porky Shinwell. Oh, he did go to Porky. Nice. Scores 100 points. Okay. So, Dr. Trevelin, why was he murdered for the money? Okay, so I got those two wrong. Why did from... Okay, she was hypnotized. Okay. Society Burglar, Guy Clarendon, 20 points. Yes. 20 points. Calvin Leach, the fence. Yes, I got that. 20 points. Oh, yes. Um, okay, so I didn't get any of those right. Add the points, so I got 40 points. Um, compare the number of leads you followed to that of Holmes. Okay, so I went to all five of those places. So then that's minus... Um, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, minus 65. So I went negative 25. Negative 25 is total score done. Shit, I'm bad. Where did he... How did he... What? 
How did he put that together? I visited all five of those locations. I don't get it. I mean, I, yeah, I kind of had bits of all of that in my head, but none of that came together. How did he really pin it down on Dr. Trevlin? I don't get it. He went there, right? 19 SW. He went there and he was like, oh yeah, it's him. Where did he get the hypnosis shit? Where did that come into play? Nobody ever mentioned that until me at the end. And yeah, logically, it made a lot of sense, but... What? What? When did he give her a sedative? Why did he give her a sedative? When was that mentioned? Oh, Sherlock, you're too damn smart. I don't know. And the minus 25 is not terrible. We could have done a lot worse, I guess. But yeah, damn. I figured out he was a society burglar, which now that I think about it makes, it was really not that big of a, a leap of deduction, but it made me feel good for a moment. Ah, damn. I was really, I was really hoping like halfway through there, I was like, oh, oh, oh yeah. He visited five locations. If you could do this, if somebody could do this for the first time ever and visit only five locations and figure it out. Yeah, you you should not be playing this game. You should be off working for some sort of agency somewhere. That that's all I'll say. That's ridiculous. But yeah, there you go. That's that's case number three done. The mystified murderess hypnosis. Oh boy. Damn. And I had it right there at the end. I was like, oh, that has to be like a hypnosis or something. But like, what are the odds of that? Pretty damn good, apparently. All right, so my name is Mang. This has been Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. I'll see you fine folks around.